So I, I just emailed you all about 20 minutes, a half an hour ago. Um, midterm one, now it's, it's all done. I have put the booklet that you used out in the literature racks in this long corridor here. You'll see them on the wall, alphabetized by last name. Um, once in a while, I can't read the last name, so I might get it wrong. But, I, but hopefully, you're, you're all, all your exams are there. And the email will tell you on your exam booklet, because the exam booklets, you all got the same questions, but, but the questions appeared in different orders. You know, I scrambled everything. So I gave you your choices on your exam booklet, along with the correct choices on your exam booklet. And I've also posted a generic uh, version of the exam that, that has a particular order that's not, it's, it's all likely not your order. There's a posted version of the exam and the solutions to the exam. And I will try to write the whys or film the whys or do the whys somewhere. As you know, from, from, if you've looked at the old exams, sometimes I manage to pull it off and sometimes I just don't. All right? About the, about the first midterm exam, the value of having it now, maybe you're used to having multiple midterms during a, during a semester, but, but I started off with one midterm. I, I took the word seriously, midterm. But, but having an early exam, early-ish exam like this is helpful just to, to give you uh, some sort of assessment early on, like how you're doing in terms of what I'm looking for and, and grade on. So it's sort of good news and bad news. Um, if you did very well, wonderful, that's the good news. The bad news is it's only 15, well, 17 and a half percent of the grade. If you did poorly, good news, bad news. The bad news is you did poorly, but the good news is it's only 17.5 percent of the grade. So the key thing is you know, if, if you're doing well, keep it up. If you're doing poorly, change. And as, as sort of a warning, if you, if you Keep doing what you were doing, you will all likely repeat your, your exam scores. It's, it's sort of uncanny. People will hit, will hit their same exam scores within two questions, give or take, over and over again. So if you, if you didn't do well and you want to do better, do differently. And part of that is, you, many of you have asked me suggestions, How, what, what do I do to do better next time? If you didn't take the old exams, take the old exams. For many reasons, they're valuable. I mean, one of them is, is those of you who did all the old exams, if you did them, you will have seen questions go by that you saw before, because I just stole them outright. Um, the other thing is I keep reinventing questions that are very similar to my questions. But you'll learn many things from the old exams. In fact, it's, it's, it's not some sort of misbehavior, you know, do the old exam, that, you know. It's, it's, it's the learning experience. The act of doing those questions and suffering over them is where you learn the material, not listening to me jibber jabber. So um, you, learn, you learn how I ask questions in general. You'll learn sort of how to de decode my questions. You can learn, you'll see that the right answer is right, the wrong answers are wrong, and if you can eliminate them, you're doing, you, know, you can answer the questions simply by eliminating all three wrong answers. You don't even have to read the other, the, the final answer. It's got to be right. Um, I work pretty hard at making sure the wrong answers are truly wrong for some basic reason. Once in a while, they're just gibberish. Um, and, and that's, so, you know, is that wrong? It just doesn't mean anything. All right. Any questions about the exam? Issues about the exam heading forward? Anything that's on your mind about that? Um, I do encourage you to go get your old exam, see what you got right, see what you got wrong by way of that email. And for, for those of you who want to do better, one thing to do is, is set aside the exam for a week. You, know, you can look at it now, whatever. Set it aside for a week and take it again. Go find the, the version that's posted on the website and take the exam again and see whether you've, you're, are you fixing the problems or do you get the same wrong answer wrong again. Okay? All right. So where, where I left off the previous Friday was talking about roller coasters, well, carousels and roller coasters, and just to remind you, so the, key, the key points that came up with, with so far are that, that, that we experience acceleration. We, we feel it. You can't feel velocity, which is an interesting thing to point out in any case. You can't, if you close your eyes and you're in a vehicle moving at constant velocity, you can't tell which way you're moving. You, 
you, you may well have done this. So you're riding on a, on a subway or a train or something which has seats facing forward backward, and you can convince yourself you're heading the wrong way. You, know, you're, you can't tell by with your eyes closed which way you're heading, in short. Because you can't feel velocity. But you can feel acceleration. The way you feel acceleration is by way of your own inertia, the inertia of all your parts. If you accelerate to the, to the right, or if I accelerate to the right, I feel my inertia causing all my parts to try to stay put, not, not pick up speed that way. And it feels like gra there's a gravity-like effect pulling me the other way. And in it's not actually gravity, it's, it's this, this feeling associated with acceleration, which is what I call it, feeling of acceleration. And it's adjustable. It depends on how fast you're accelerating. If you accelerate like crazy, it's going to be very strong. If you accelerate weakly, it's going to be weak. And to put it in perspective, the feeling that you get if you accelerate to the right at 9.8 meters per second squared, not a number chosen at random, is the same feeling of, a, of your full weight. It feels like your full weight pulling you up the opposite direction. So, so it's referred to often as, as one G, one, one gravity, not of actual weight, but of the feeling of acceleration. So if you accelerate it at the, at, at the, the amount of the acceleration of gravity one way, you feel, you feel a weight-like experience equal to your weight the other way. Is that okay? And you can, you can accelerate 2 Gs, 3 g twice gravity, three times gravity, four times gravity, five. Uh, by the time you get to about five times gravity, this is hard to tolerate for any length of time. And somewhere between five, six, give or take, uh, times the acceleration of gravity, we, we do things like blackout. You, your, your blood doesn't circulate properly and stuff, and so you, you pass out. So, so amusement parks, um, half, the, half the excitement and fun of an amusement park is, is accelerations. And the feelings that you get because you're accelerating, you feel flung in the other direction every time. And they'll take you up to about five times the acceleration of gravity briefly sometimes. And that's already a lot for most people. And they'll, they'll come out like, oh, my neck hurts and stuff. Um, a little bit beyond that, and they would start having customers uh, conked out at the end of the ride, so they would get in trouble. All right? So there's the feeling of acceleration. Uh, the direction matters. If the feeling of acceleration is downward because you're accelerating upward, you feel, you feel not only your ordinary weight experience, but you also feel this feeling of acceleration stacked on top of it. You feel super heavy, so you accelerate downward. If you accelerate to the side, you feel a combination of your weight downward and the, and the feeling of acceleration to the side the other way, stacked there. So you feel like a gravity-like sensation, which I call apparent weight at some cockeyed angle in between. And if you're accelerating downward, the feeling of acceleration is upward, and it partially, or maybe more than partially, uh, uh, cancels your experience of actual weight. And actually, if you accelerate downward at a special rate, the acceleration due to gravity, if you're falling, your feeling of acceleration is upward and, and exactly as strong as your, your experience of weight. Because you're accelerating downward at 9.8 meters per second. This is squared downward. That means you get a 1G upward feeling of acceleration. It cancels your weight perfectly. You feel no weight at all. So when, when you're dropping, when you're falling, as it, like in a drop tower at a, at a King's Dominion or some other amusement park, you can't feel any weight at all. It's not like you're truly weightless. You have weight. Sorry, you're still there here on the surface of the earth. But you can't experience any of it. You feel nothing. And we're, we're the human animal is terrified by that, at least unless you've gotten super used to it. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm falling. And panic sets in. All right? So that's, that's the feeling of, of, of weightlessness. It comes with rapid downward acceleration. Ideally, the full acceleration of gravity, but, but anywhere near that, you, oh, my, you feel weightless. All right? The loop, the, so, so you know, finally, to, to go to the, the, the ultimate example of feeling of acceleration uh, and uh, this experience is when you're on the loop, the loop. So, and you do it fast. There are loop -the loops that take you very slowly around in some sort of corkscrew or whatever, and, now, and they're just hanging you upside down for a while and shaking you down for money because it all comes flying out of your pockets and rains down below. 
But the actual loop-to-loop, -loop, it's much more interesting. You go over it fast. And when you do that, you're accelerating downward fast. And to, to lead into this topic, let me ask you a question. Ooh, 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 here it is. So here's a question. You can click on in. A ball is falling past you. Can you push down on a ball that's falling past you? You okay with the question? A question or the question? See what you think. Talk about it among yourselves, because it's about a 50-50 split right now. Yeah, so I'm, ta I'm talking about this. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Now, could I push on it as it went by and push it downward? All right, I'll give you to the, to the minute, the 60 second. Three, two, one, zero. So there, there's the split. It's, it's, it shifted a little after I talked. But let's, let's try it experimentally. Here we go. Ready? Yeah, sure. No problem. You literally just reach out and shove it down. Before I shoved it, what was its acceleration? 9.8 meters per second downward. While I was shoving it, what was its acceleration? Greater than 9.8. I was making it accelerate downward faster than gravity alone would do it. And there's no problem with doing that. And if that were you, and we'll do it in slow motion, you're dropping by. And I reach out, and I push down. Look at what's going on. You're accelerating downward especially fast, faster than gravity alone will do it. Prior to me pushing on you, you were feeling weightless. That is, you're, you're in free fall. You can't feel any weight at all. Once I push down and make you go faster, you're accelerating so fast downward that you feel pushed upward by this feeling of acceleration. It's, it's super strong. You feel like you have gravity pulling you toward the sky. So you actually feel weight now, but in the wrong direction, toward the sky. Is that okay? And during this process, you and I are pushed against each other, because I am pushing you downward to make you accelerate downward. And Newton's third law says you have to push back. I mean, even if you fell asleep, you're busy reading your mail, um, you have to push back. So that's the, the, the concept that underlies the loop-the-loop. -loop. So where's the pink ball? There it is. It's always this, this ball is getting older and older for some reason. But when I make it go around in a circle like this, the ball is accelerating the whole time. It happens to be accelerating towards my hand, which itself is another interesting story. Um, and if it's going at constant speed, it's accelerating exactly towards my hand. But if that was you, you would be being pulled toward the center. So you're accelerating toward the center. You would feel a, a, a feeling of acceleration outward away from the center, and that, okay. So if I now rotate this, and now it's vertical, when you're going over the, let's look at the bottom first, because it's just there. When you're at the bottom, you're accelerating up. So you feel not only your weight, your full weight, but you feel a feeling of acceleration downward. You feel super heavy down there at the bottom, because of that upward acceleration. At the top, now you're accelerating toward my hand, that's downward, and you feel a feeling of acceleration upward. Ooh, that's a lot like me playing with the baseball. And if it's, the acceleration's fierce enough, if it's too slow, of course everything doesn't go right, right? If I go too slow, plot, you know, you fall. But if I go fast enough, you're actually accelerating downward faster than gravity would, alone would make you. At that top, it may not look like it, but the ball is, come, is, is traveling in an arc that is tighter than the arc of a falling ball. It's being bent harder. So it's accelerating downward harder. And you feel flung toward the sky. You feel like weight, like there's a gravity-like experience pulling you towards the clouds. 
And right now, it doesn't quite look like a loop-the-loop, -loop, but it will we'll get closer. Because that's pulling in from the center with a string. No loop-the-loops operate that way that I know of. So here, here's you again. You're sitting on, and my hand's now the track. You're coming along, and you go whoop over the loop-the-loop. -loop. Whoop, and you go back. And I'm going fast for a reason, because I need to go fast enough that that arc is a downward acceleration that's, that's stronger than gravity. If I go too slow, the book will fall off my hand. But if I go fast, at the top, it's the same story as me shoving the book down. It's just a funny version of it. So it's pressed into my hand. I'm pressed against it. It's pressed in my hand. And that's you going over the loop-the-loop. -loop. Well, it's almost there. All right. So now I got the real one. The loop loop, of course, you're, there's a track, there is a car, and there is you. This is the track, and I'm going to whip it. I'm going to carry the track around in a circle, right? OK, no problem. That's the car. And here is you. So we pour you into the car. Ah, oh, oops, I already make a mess before I make a mess. No point spilling before I actually spill. And for, for obvious reasons, I use disappearing ink always for these sorts of experiments, even though it matches my shirt. All right. OK. So you're in the car on the track, and you're about to go over the loop-loop. -loop. And all the challenges in starting and stopping. The in-between is fine. He says casually, ready. Get set. Once I'm doing it, it's fine, but how do I stop? <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. <laughs> and if you want to try it, when you can try that one, or you just can try this one, right? It's hard to break a ball. You know, it's just no, no problem. So when you're going around that, now this one I feel safe for talking. Um, when you're going around the loop, the track is the car is, is accelerating downward faster than gravity. So the, car, the track has to shove on the car, shove it down. And the car pushes back. So, so the, the, the track and the car are pressing against each other hard. And you, sitting there in the car, have to be pushed down as well to make you arc downward, to make you accelerate downward that fast. So the car is shoving you down, and you're shoving the car back. So you're pr you literally are pressed into your seat. And everything in your pockets and on, the hat on your head they're all being pushed down as well, so everything stays in your pocket. Even though you're actually upside down, with your eyes closed, you can't tell you're upside down. You feel pulled toward your seat, which happens to be the sky, sky direction, which is, OK, that's odd. But, you're, but you're, you feel pulled to your seat. The coins in your pocket feel pulled into your pocket. Your hat feels pulled onto your head. The whole works. Nothing falls off. So it, you don't make much money sitting there trying to collect the reigning cash under the loop loop. You want to ca collect cash, go to the berserker, where it hangs you upside down periodically, or the corkscrew curls, where, you, where you're hanging upside down, you're not accelerating downward fast. And therefore, gravity is pulling you down for real, and everything falls. OK? Any questions about, about loop loops, the feeling of a loop loop? So next time you're, you ride one, I mean, maybe you don't want to close your eyes because it's too much fun. But if you close your eyes and try to figure out when you're at the top, you, you won't be able to do it. Because um, you will never feel not pressed into your seat. There will be variations on how hard you're pressed into your seat, but, but you can't tell. All right? That's probably enough story about the feeling of acceleration associated with various amusement park rides. They're, they're full of different variations. OK. Um, so let me go over to bicycles. And the story of bicycles is, to my mind, a, lot of, a story of, of stability. Um, the, the mo one of the most amazing things on a bicycle is that you can ride this two-wheeled vehicle and stay up on it. And so the general observations are that a three- or four-wheeled bicycle, I've never had a tricycle, but this was, this is. Our kids, toy. So this is, this is as old as our kids, which is so they're getting there. They're older than you guys. 
So four wheels. And on a four-wheel vehicle, life is great for, for little kids because they spend a lot of time at rest. All right, so I can go up on the table, but OK, so I don't fit very well anymore. It's a little, it is a little extreme, OK? I need, I need my grandchildren. All right, so you can sit on there. And it's stable at rest. So kids spend a lot of time at rest on tricycles and, and, and such. So that's great. If they tip it a little bit, it goes back, which is an interesting observation already. So it, it's, it's super for kids who want to be still a lot, but eventually they, they learn how to move and move fast. And then they learn to go downhill. So they get on, on one of these guys, and they're going, you know, they're going, wow, it's great. They, you know, Look at me, Mom. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, touching anything. I'm going really fast. And then they see the tree in front of them. And they make a very sudden turn. And you all have either done this or have had friends that did this or siblings, whatever. You make a sudden turn on a tricycle. And the tricycle drives out from under you. Whew, off it goes. And you go inertial and hit the tree anyway. Or take out, you know, you, you, you braid your chin. You, so the emergency room is full of kids showing up with with injuries somewhere around here where they hit the pavement. Is this familiar to people? What's the problem here? Three wheeled and, and more vehicles. Vehicles that have at least three wheels are stable at rest. That is that they, they can, it is possible to find an equilibrium. Moreover, it's an equilibrium to which you return if you tip a little bit. So I'll, I'll deal with that in a second. It's called a stable equilibrium. They have three, three wheels or more, three legs or more on a table gives you a stable equilibrium. That's fine at rest, but in motion there's a dynamic problem, motion problem. That if you're moving, and you, so you, you and the bicycle, you're moving in a straight line at a steady pace, that's what you tend to keep doing if you force, the, if you cause the bicycle to suddenly accelerate, the tricycle, to suddenly accelerate it may well leave you behind in various ways. It can't help you, and it can't work with you enough to make sure you come along, and so it can drive out from under you. And that causes all kinds of disasters for, for tricycles. It's a problem for cars as well. So, I mean, I'll ask you this question, and you sort of get one choice, and you better get this right. And this, this goes into the, public service announcement category of, of this class. But if you boost up a sports utility vehicle or a little truck, you put giant tires on it or whatever, you play with the suspension so you have to get a ladder to, to go in the cab, um, is that going to affect the turning stability of that vehicle? Is it going to is it gonna make it more stable, less stable, or the same? Anybody, you okay with the question? You, you get uh, 20 seconds on this one. We've got one, one answer E coming in, which is one way to, yeah. <laughs> oh. All right, five, four, three, two, one, stop. Oh, come on. There it is. B it is. More likely to, to, to tip over. So you know, what's, what's the issue here? As you, as you make it taller, the vehicle taller, this inertial problem where, where, the, where the cab or, the, or you, you way up there above the tires, you keep going inertially while the vehicle drives out from under you. It gets worse and worse. And so public service announcement is be careful where you put this. In fact, the, the center of gravity and center of mass of your vehicle, uh, you do not want it high. You want it as, as low as is reasonable because of how the stability of, of, a, of, a, of a three or more uh, wheeled vehicle works. So here, here is how that vehicle, that stability works. When you're in a stable, when you're, all the wheels on the ground are on the ground, you have the, the vehicle and you, are in a stable equilibrium. And a stable equilibrium is this. First of all, it's equilibrium, zero net force. And actually, zero net torque. It's zero net influences, whatever they are, torques and forces, lumped together. 
And if you tip it any way you like, forces and torques arise such that they push you back towards the equilibrium. The equilibrium is sort of self-supporting. Um, it, 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 it fixes itself if you tip it. So it's, it is called a stable equilibrium. And a, an example of a stable equilibrium is this one, the ball on that red track. That ball is at equilibrium at the bottom, zero net force. And if you take it away from equilibrium, it's now on a ramp that develops a ramp force back towards equilibrium. It loves to go back to equilibrium. So that's, that equilibrium is stable. This motion back and forth around equilibrium is the one you've seen many times in this class before. It's very much like the bouncing around equilibrium on a spring. It's like the swinging back and forth about equilibrium of a pendulum. And you know, why does this happen? Why, are, why do the, the, you get restoring forces, restoring torques, back towards the equilibrium? It in, one way to see that is to, is to bring up a new observation in physics. It, it's, it's things we've seen before, but re, recast in a new way. I talked about energy, and I talked about energy having two forms, kinetic and potential energy, where potential, you know, a variety pack of, of types of potential energy. Potential energy is energy stored in forces, right? Gravitational potential energy is energy stored in, in gravity. Elastic potential energy is any energy stored in some sort of spring. Um, there's electrostatic stored in forces between charges. It goes on. So potential energy and forces are connected. They're buddies, I mean, more than buddies. They're, relate, they're close relatives. And it turns out then that the forces are, and, and torques too that show up when you disturb something away from equilibrium have a lot to do with what potential energy starts to show up when you leave equilibrium. And as a general observation about how things in our universe work, they accelerate, well, we know, they accelerate in the direction of the net force on them. That's old news. But because, net, because forces, in general, and net force also, are related to potential energy, objects also accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible. It's, th that, uh, those observations are identical, it turns out. They, they, it, it accelerates in the direction of, of the net force. It accelerates in the direction that reduces total potential energy as quickly as possible. That's, it's the same. That's the same direction, same, same thing. The, the getting rid of potential energy means letting the forces do their thing. And so you accelerate in that direction. So it shouldn't be, a, I don't mean to leave it as some great mystery. Oh my God, where did this come from? And how, you know, it's useful. The, point of, the re reason for bringing it up is because it's going to be useful for, to us today. And just to, to, to flesh out an example for that, if I take this pendulum away from equilibrium, I, I will end up having to raise, it will go to, it'll go up, it'll get higher. It'll have more gravitational potential energy than before. If you don't believe it, here's the ball's top right now. It's higher, right? More gravitational potential energy. And my claim is it will accelerate in the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible. Well, it's really only got one important potential energy, gravitational. And it will try to reduce that as quickly as it can. It will accelerate in that direction. And that direction is this way. So if I let go of it, it accelerates that way, picks up speed. So it's just a useful observation. There will come time today, in fact, when it's hard to figure out what way the forces and torques are acting. Ah, too hard. So just look for, look for a, a way in which the system can get rid of potential energy. That's the way it'll accelerate. OK? So here, this little ball. Same idea. Take it away from, from equilibrium, its energy goes up and it goes back. It's desperate to get rid of potential energy. Um, tip this vehicle. The forces that show up are a mess. However, I have actually invested gravitational potential energy in it again. The tipping process has lifted its center of gravity. The center of gravity of this guy is, is, is somewhere here inside the R of radio flyer. It's, it's, I can't touch it. And when I tip this, just by sheer geometry alone, that point goes up a little bit higher off the table and off the ground. So I, I put some energy into it. 
and it's desperate to get rid of that energy, and it goes back. Is that okay? Uh, I will point out that if I tip it too far, right, I, I, I took it to a point where, where suddenly it was able to get rid of, if it continued to try to get rid of total potential energy, it actually went the wrong way. So it is possible for things to have arrangements where, they, where the equilibrium doesn't, doesn't save you. What I'm trying to do is, is feed into the, the, uh, the, t the, the boosted up cars, the cars that are too high. If you, if you tip them just a little, this, st this st stability effect occurs. They, they, they go up a little bit, and consequently they want to go back. So they accelerate back if you, if you get rid of whatever it was that was causing the tip. But if you tip them too far, they suddenly discover, ooh, we can reduce our total potential energy by continuing to tip over, and they do. So the higher you make one of these vehicles, the more difficult it is to, uh, to make sure you don't go beyond the limits of that stable equilibrium. It's like this guy's got a stable equilibrium like that. It's got a very low center of gravity right now. And every, every tip I make just enormously um, raises that center of gravity. But if I do this, you know, the center of gravity is above that, that, that base there, and it is in a stable equilibrium. But I can only barely tip it and have it go back. If I tip it too much, it figured out how to reduce its total potential energy another way by falling over. OK? So as a rule, just in the case of the tricycle or, the, or anything, or a car, you know, I can't sit on the actual tricycle. I can sit on this guy. This guy has a stable equilibrium. There's a simple recipe for knowing whether it's in a stable equilibrium. And that is, is the center of gravity, the whole system, above a polygon made by the contact points with the ground. So this is a four-wheel vehicle here. It has four contact points with the ground. That, that creates a rectangle in this case. It's, it's pretty much a square. And the, a name for that square on the ground is base of support. So that base of support is crucial to stability. As long as my center of gravity is above that base of support, I'm in a stable equilibrium. And it's a geometry problem. If I tip a little bit, I'm still above that base of support. My center of gravity is still above it, and I'll go back. If I tip too far to the point where my center of gravity is no longer above that base of support, then I go over. And um, base of support, yeah. as long as you've got at least three contact points with the ground, the base of support has some area to it. It's got, you, know, you can be above it. And we'll come to something when you only have two contact points to the ground. That's a bicycle, and life is complicated for a bicycle. But what I want to do is show you this little demonstration here. This guy, so this is a physics toy. Um, it's three, three layers in this little tower uh, arranged so that the layers all move, skew together nicely. And hanging from the center of the center layer is a little, little weight. And what that's allows us to see is the center of gravity is right here in the, in the center of the center tower, center of center floor. And the little plumb bob tells us, is that point above the base of support, which is the bottom layer of the tower? So it's, it's fleshing out my whole story. It has a base of support we can see, namely the lowest floor. It has a center of gravity we can see, namely the point at which the plumb bob hangs. And the, plumb bob, the little plumb bob tells us, are we, is that center of gravity above the base of support? You okay with the idea? Our question for the <coughs> And sure enough, it's stable right now because the center of gravity is above the base of support. But I can start skewing it. And at this point, I'm getting close. The center of gravity is still above the base of support, but barely. And if I go a little bit farther, I've overshot right about now. Ah! Over it goes. So as a recipe for, for, for use in, through life, if you want something to not tip over, make sure, first of all, it's at rest. It's got a base of support, and number one. Number two is make sure the center of gravity of this object, that is the effective location of its total weight, is above that, vertically above that base of support somewhere. 
So if you, you have a, a, your vehicle, you start attaching things to, the, to the, the luggage rack on top. You start, you, you put a ladder on it that sticks way out to the right and you decide you really want to see the concert over there from that ladder and you start walking out the ladder. And so you're shifting the center of gravity farther and farther out onto the ladder away from those four wheels that are touching the ground. As soon as the grand total center of gravity of the system goes outside that wheelbase, that, that surface, over you go, all right? And the higher your whole structure is, the easier it is to get beyond that point and cause disaster. All right, so that's the story of objects at rest being stable. Um, it turns out that for, for a tricycle, it's, it, it's stable at rest because of this basis support idea and the fact that it's in a stable equilibrium to which it will return each time you tip it. But when you start turning it and so on, you're now asking its, its restoring forces and torques to help you make the turn and not go inertial and, and crash. So when you're riding that tricycle along at high speed and you suddenly, you suddenly make the turn, it will begin to tip or, or come close to. It will start summoning up those restoring forces and torques, trying to go back to its base of support. But th they're only so strong and they will start working on you to try to make sure you go with the vehicle. But if they're not very strong, you may not go with the vehicle and you'll, you'll end up going inertial. It will, go, it will tip to the point where it's outside of its base of support and it will fl flip over. So this is, you know, in a nutshell, the whole story with the tricycles are great at rest. They're not so great in motion. They're unstable in motion if you're, if you're too aggressive with the acceleration. So, the reason why we ride bicycles uh, has to do with that. So, stable equilibria we, we got. Another possibility is what's called an unstable equilibrium. If I'm very careful here, I can get the ball to stay in the unstable equilibrium there. It's tough because there, there are now, now no longer restoring forces. They're anti-restoring, they're disasters. Ah, I can usually get it. Come on, buckle. It's like with the watch pot. Ah, you know it's there, right? You can get it. Ah, yeah, I can spend all day at it. It's like you can be watching paint dry. Um, there is a point of, of equilibrium where the marble would be there at zero net force, and if it's motionless, it'll stay that way. Life is good. But the slightest disturbance and forces or torques and things arise that push it the wrong way, that push it away from equilibrium. They're anti-restoring, they're non-restoring, they're a disaster. So that equilibrium is called an unstable equilibrium. One more try. Oh, come on. Ah, I get lick it and stick it, but I won't do that. Okay, so things in, with unstable equilibria include, I lost track of my, I had a broom, but I lost my broom. All right, someone nabbed it. Okay, this guy has an unstable equilibria. I mean, it actually has some tiny base of support, but, but for all practical purposes, it's just an unstable equilibrium. You can get it balanced perfectly, but good luck. Bicycle is another case in point. The bicycle, when it's like this, at rest, in principle, you can get it just right. You can get that equilibrium. And this one I know I'll never get, right? In principle, it's there. With the slightest disturbance, and it goes over. In this case, the equilibrium is one that when it begins to tip away from the equilibrium, its potential energy, its total potential energy, begins to go down, which means, ooh, it likes this. Do, it, do more. So as it begins to tip, its center of gravity is descending. This is good. It accelerates in that direction, and over it goes. So it turns out, as a general rule, unstable equilibria are maximums in potential energy. They're the way you can arrange it so it has as much potential energy as it can without changing the story. So when I take this bicycle off the ground, and put it up to its unstable equilibrium, it has as much gravitational potential energy as it can have. It's as high as possible. 
and any tip lowers its gravitational en potential energy, which it likes, and it does more, and over it goes. So unstable equilibria are maxima in, in potential energy, like putting a marble on the, on the top of a dome. It's as high as it can get. Stable equilibria are the reverse. They're minima, lowest points in potential energy, as low as it can go. So any disturbance tends to take it back towards the low point. So this is, this is, this is stable. The other, the, that's the bottom of a bowl. The other one was the top of a dome. All right? So bicycles live their life in these unstable equilibria, which by itself seems like a stupid idea. It's, it's rotten for, you know, for, for a kid, who want, for anybody who wants to just stay put, standing, sitting on this thing, it's not going to work. You're going to tip over. So it's, it's lousy at rest. What's, what, however, is great is it's fine in motion. It's dynamically stable for interesting reasons. So at rest, you can't keep it upright. Like, there are people that can. They come to the red light out here by uh, O'Hill Dining Hall or whatever, and they're, they're, they're kind of dancing on their bicycles trying to keep it upright, and they, some of them succeed. But at rest, it's tough. Um, what, I should say what they're doing there is they're doing the equivalent of this. This is an unstable equilibrium, but I can fix it. And what I'm doing is I keep putting my hand under the center of gravity. The center of gravity is right here, halfway up the stick. And I, I'm looking at that, and I'm putting my hand under it all the time, fixing. Yeah, it's an unstable equilibrium, but I'm fixing it. And that's where I want to look. If I look down here at my hand, I'm, I'm, I'm sunk. I don't get, any, I don't get the right in, insight. If I look at the tip, I don't get the right insight. I'm actually really looking in the middle. And somewhere along the line, I lost my broom. I was going to show you the broom, but it's, a, it's classic balancing a broom. The bicycle does that trick all the time, and it does it automatically. As you're heading forward, it's constantly driving itself under your center of gravity. It steers automatically to do this. So much automatically that it's possible to do it without you steering at all. So this is how people ride bicycles with no hands. The bicycle does the trick all by itself. It drives under your center of gravity and fixes the unstable equilibrium. All right? Uh, children's bicycles are especially good at doing this trick. So for a young person's bicycle, um, it steers under your center of gravity so aggressively that it's easy to ride, no hands. And to prove that, you can simply take the bicycle with no rider and roll it down a hill. And probably some of you have done that. You just get it, get it going, and then it just drives itself. Woo, off it goes. It's steering all by itself. Um, it stays up. Uh, older, per, you know, older, more sporty bicycles for, for adults and stuff are less um, dynamically stable because that gives them more responsiveness. The, the, the highly stable bicycles for children are a little harder to steer and to control um, subtly. So there's a, there's a trade-off between stability and uh, performance. When a bicycle, so when a bicycle is heading forward, the, 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 the key observation is it steers automatically to rescue you. It steers under your center of gravity. And how, well, how does it do it? It does it for two reasons. One of them's easy to see, and one of them's a little more tricky, or understand, at least. Suppose the bicycle, I'll try to make it so you all can see this. Suppose the bicycle is heading along, away from you all, and it begins to lean to the left with the rider, for some, for whatever reason. Having leaned to the left like this, it's now out of the unstable equilibrium, and it's beginning to, to descend. It's, it's going to accelerate this way because of uh, it's lowering its total potential energy by going further that way. So, so it's, a, it's in trouble. To rescue this bicycle, which is heading that way, it needs to steer to go back under your combined center of gravity. And the steering direction it wants to do is a left turn. It wants to turn left so it drives this way to, to, to come underneath you. I hope you can sort of see that and feel it in your gut. Watch what happens when I tip the bicycle. Watch what happens to the steering. I'm going to tip it to the left. It's steered to the left. Do you see that happen? Why did it do that? It's steered to the left because it has basically two parts to this bicycle, right? It's not, a, it's not one rigid object. It's got two, two rigid objects. 
and, and it's got one steering axis. When it steered like this, it managed to lower its center of gravity just a little bit. Because of how the bicycle is made and arranged, tipping it this way, if, if, it, if it keeps straight, it's a little higher on average than if it steers. So it's, it's getting rid of a little potential energy by doing that. And that's why I said, why did, why did I go into this harangue about objects accelerating in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible? For this reason, because it's really hard to figure out what the heck forces and torques are acting on this bicycle when I tip it. But it's easier to see that if you look at all the details, it's actually gone down a little bit. And so it steers in order to lower itself. And it steers the right way, thank goodness. And this rescues it. Is that okay? So that's the first reason why bicycles steer spontaneously in the right direction to rescue you. There's a second effect that shows up, and this one's more subtle. And it has to do with angular momentum. When a, when a wheel is turning, and the wheel I have in mind is the front wheel, when it's turning like this, and it's, we're going to be heading that way. When it's turning like this, if it begins to tip, the ground, which is pushing up on the wheel, is now pushing up off center on the wheel. I, I don't want to break my fingers. So it's pushing up here. It's, got a, it's not pushing right towards the center of the wheel, which is its, actually its, its center rotation, its pivot. It's off to the side. And that produces a torque on the wheel. And the torque, when it pushes up like this, is that it's, it's a rotation like this. It's toward us, according to the right-hand rule. So here's the subtle idea. Yeah, I've got just about enough time to do this. When the wheel is turning like this, we're heading off this way, OK? Turning like this. Its angular momentum is away from you. Is that OK? If it's tilted and being pushed up by the ground this way, that torque is toward me. So what happens is, when you begin to tip a spinning wheel like this, it begins, its angular momentum begins to evolve. It goes from turning, when you tip it like this, it twists like this. It spontaneously rotates. It's taking its angular momentum from going away from us to toward me. It's rotating. And that's a, an effect called precession. If it doesn't make any sense to you, well, that's OK. It's, it does, it's tough. What I'm going to show you, I'll show you the precession. I'm going to get the wheel really going. So we're, that's fun. OK, so that'll do. OK, so the wheel's really going. And instead of pushing up from the ground, I'm going to pull up from the side. So this whole cl clip already, that'll do. Okay. So it's not going to do. I'll get killed. Then we'll have a class holiday for a year. All right, got it. It's angular momentum's away from you guys. We're pulling up this way. That is angular momentum that way. It's going to turn the other way. It's, it's, it's steering, but it's steering the opposite of what I just showed you before. See that steering effect? It's because that rope is pulling up there, exerting a torque on it, and steering its direction of, of angular momentum. So this effect also shows up in a bicycle when the bicycle wheel is spinning. It's steering because of this. It's called gyroscopic precession, or just precession. If you don't remember it, well, that's life. But what, before you depart, let me show you one more at, uh, ca case of it. You're all familiar with this effect where you drop rolly things, wheel-shaped things, coins, hula hoops, anything that's like a wheel. You drop it on the ground, and if it's rolling, it, it has a surprising ability to stay upright. It's that effect. If I just roll this bicycle wheel across the room, there's no reason it should stay up all the way across the room. It's that gyroscopic precession effect. It's steering itself, always so, so as to rescue it. Ash, boom. OK, thanks. And we'll uh, go back to things on Friday. <laughs>